And this week is hate. What do you do with all the emotions that immediately rise up in the immediate aftermath uh, at math of a loss? We're dealing in this series with the specific blues of loss. And I don't care who you are, you're never prepared for a loss. It always comes out of nowhere. When I received the phone call that my grandfather died, I remember to this day where I was standing. I remember how the light hit the kitchen table. And I remember where my boys were and what they each said in response. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You got the call. It might have been last week. It might have been 20 years ago. In July, I got a call from a vibrant 50-something here at Lake Forest, a ministry partner, to tell me I've got cancer. And I can remember where I was. I was standing on the balcony of our condo at Wrightsville Beach for the week, looking out over the, the sunset of the sound, and he's telling me he has cancer. And a few short months later, we're having his funeral right here, wearing Hawaiian shirts to celebrate his fabulous spirit. But we lost him. It always comes out of nowhere. And not just the huge losses, but the everyday losses of life. Loss of a job. The limitation of a dream. I thought I would get better at this and go further. But I'm stopping right here. The loss of a pet is a big deal for many people. I think that's how God made it. For us to connect with these other beings who are somehow an alien intelligence and affection. And yet... We know each other in a unique way. The loss of beauty, the loss of health, getting rejected by the place, the school, the job, the person that you wanted. I've learned in my years in dealing with this and, and walking with other people more than my own loss that whatever you're feeling in the immediate aftermath of a loss, we're talking like right after it today, okay? That immediate aftermath, whatever you're feeling is okay right then because you're kind of in shock, and this is how God made us. Shock is okay. Anger is okay. Rage is okay. Numbness is okay. Some people don't feel anything at all and are like ashamed and they need to hide it because they feel like they should only be crying or something else. But at first, it's okay to be however you be. And sometimes there's this sense, especially in religious circles, that, that you're supposed to immediately be okay and be all like, hey, God's in control. We're going to make it. Everything's fine. And quote, quote a line from a Christian song or something. But that doesn't usually help right after the lost. Last week and this week, we're still in the hurt phase with all the emotions are fresh after a loss because there are all these natural emotions that are how God made us. How do we deal with them in a faithful, spiritual way toward God? And today, I want to say that how we handle our House of Blues emotions, especially anger, which it, it resolves out and that becomes a primary one, how we deal with them affects whether we move from hurt toward hate and hating life and dropping out of things or from hurt toward healing. And there's a true story about Jesus to meditate on in this regard. And it's John chapter 11. We're going to be there the whole time. You can use a Bible in your seat or your own Bible. John chapter 11, verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. By the way, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were three of the closest, best personal friends of Jesus during his life on this earth. And this Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same Mary who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. She was pretty tight with him. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one whom you love, our brother Lazarus, is sick. Now, if you fast forward in the story, Lazarus, who got sick, he actually dies. And Jesus comes a few days later to visit his sisters after his death. It picks up in verse 17 of John 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. So here's the question. Jesus is coming. I mean, Jesus, okay? And only one of the sisters comes out to meet him, and the other one stays in the house. Why is that? Well, what's going on here is the ancient Jewish practice called sitting shiva. You have to say that very carefully, okay? <laughs> Last week, I, I said uh, Christians are not always uh, shiny, happy people. But in the third service, I got tongue-tied, and I said hiney, shappy people. Um, and somebody made a T-shirt for me. It's in my office. Hiney, shappy. 
Um, maybe I'll wear that next week. So sitting Shiva, will you say it very carefully with me? Sitting Shiva. It was a very ancient practice among the Jewish people in the Jewish religion. And here's what would happen is when you lost a loved one or one of your friends did, um, uh, you would go and sit with them. The word Shiva comes from seven. For seven days, they would do no work, and they would just sit in their home, the person who experienced the loss. And you, if you knew them, you would come and visit them. And you'd come and sit on the floor with your friend. You'd just sit there in their presence, and you don't say anything unless they say something to you. Sitting Shiva because there just aren't words for some pain. Isn't that true? And how many of you have been in a situation where someone's lost somebody and you're, you, you've been brave enough to actually show up and, and be there with them and you're trying to think of what to say and then you say something and you're like, I can't believe I just said that. I made it worse. Well, they had a solution for that. You just sit for seven days. And if the person wants to talk, you talk. And if they want to just sit, you sit. Sitting Shiva, the Jewish way of saying to the person, I love you. I care for you. I am flesh and blood present in this journey of loss with you. If you want to talk, great. But I just want to let you know with my presence, you're not alone. It's a beautiful practice that we have much to learn from. Maybe you can, from, you can think of your engagement with your friends as sitting Shiva. So you have people coming from all over, particularly from Jerusalem, uh, to sit Shiva with Mary and Martha. And Jesus shows up on the scene a few days into it. So one of the sisters stays in the house to keep sitting with people. And the other one comes out to meet him outside of town. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Translation, guilt trip, right? <laughs> uh, verse 22. But I know that even now, okay, God will give you whatever you ask because you're Jesus. And Jesus answered, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life now, not just at the last day. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives now by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is a really good question to leave hanging for yourself this morning. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, Martha told him. I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come into the world. Now we're going to skip a couple more verses. I encourage you to go home and read this whole passage as your pregame ritual today, okay, while you're cooking your nachos. Uh, it says they all eventually end up at Lazarus' tomb. And now the second sister puts the guilt trip. Evidently, it's a family thing. Verse 32. When Mary, uh, Let's all read this together. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Verse 35 has two words in it. Shortest verse of the Bible. Let's read it again. Jesus wept. If you happen to have grown up in church and like in Sunday school like I did, this was memory verse Sunday right here, baby. I got one. Jesus wept. Can I have my candy now, my gold star? Right? I nailed that one every time. Uh, one of my seminary teachers, Dallas Willard, says that familiarity can breed unfamiliarity. And what happens sometimes is that some verses, like Jesus wept, become so familiar that we lose the depth and the edge and the significance that they have. Jesus wept. This is our meditation this morning as we look at Jesus and lift up our loss in view of his. Now, if you're to read on in this story, you'll discover Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Not just like someday in the sweet by and by, like a couple of hours later, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus has read ahead in the story. He's the son of God. He knows what's coming next. He even knows also where the whole thing is headed, and yet he weeps. We Christians, and by the way, those of you here who consider yourself a spiritual explorer, this is where we ultimately think our hope lies. Our hope does not lie ultimately in this world. We will always have trouble, suffering, and loss in this fallen world. You cannot have your best life now. 
through Jesus in this life. There will always be pain. Our ultimate hope is only in the universal resurrection through Jesus when he returns on judgment day and kicks off the eternal reality of God's kingdom of love. And Jesus knows that's going to happen, and he knows he's about to rise raised Lazarus miraculously. So he could have just said, enough crying already. Resurrection's about to come. Everybody just, you know, quit your crying, right? But he doesn't. He weeps. And I want to reflect on this this morning with you. And I want to offer you some observations, some principles from myself and some other writers on how to grieve like Jesus in the immediate aftermath of your loss. This has just happened. So that your hurt flows toward healing and not toward hate. And here's our first meditation on it. You can be best friends with Jesus and get angry in your blues. That's good news to me, because I've been angry in my blues, and I've had religious people shoot on me and tell me that's not okay. Okay? Verse 21 and verse 32. Think back carefully to what I just said and didn't say. Verse 21 and verse 32. Both Mary and Martha, two of Jesus' closest friends, They believed he's the Messiah. They believed he's going to resurrect on the last day. They're upset, they're sad, and they're mad at Jesus. And they tell him so for not being there on time to heal their brother. He's Jesus for Christ's sake, right? (laughs) If you had gotten here in time, you could have healed him, right? Jesus does not notice this. He does not rebuke Martha's angry guilt trip or Mary's angry tears at his too late arrival, too late for them. He doesn't rebuke the unspoken but ever-present theological, philosophical question that they had that day, the question that you have every time you lose someone or something or a dream that you cared about. And that question is this, Jesus, you could have been, like the gospel song says, an on-time God. You could have changed that. You could have prevented that loss. You undoubtedly have the power to have prevented it, but you didn't. And in the immediate aftermath, I don't even care why you didn't. I'm just mad that you didn't. We all have this unspoken question, and maybe you're bold enough to ask it. The psalmist's words, very biblical to ask that question. But Jesus doesn't rebuke this unspoken side to their anger, and he doesn't rebuke your anger and your blues. And the reason is because if you've read the Gospels, if you've, if you've gone on a date with Jesus by reading the Gospels, which I highly encourage you do, you know that Jesus got angry in the face of loss often without being sinful in the way he expressed it. He was perfect and he got angry when things just weren't right. And when you get angry as part of your blues emotions, you're just like Jesus. Something's not right because of sin and evil and death. You lost someone or something, they're not there in the story, or that dream has died, and it shouldn't be like that, but it is. And anger is a natural response. God made you that way. And that's just singing your blues like Jesus, like Jesus' best friends. A second reflection, you can have great faith and still weep in the face of your loss, and in fact, it's an important part of moving toward healing from loss and not hatred. Jesus weeps, Mary weeps, Martha weeps in the face of this loss here in the Bible. In fact, if you work through the scriptures, often the people who seem to have the most faith in God and the most vibrant connection with God seem to be the people who go through the most Kleenex. Fascinating spiritual maturity, becoming more like Jesus, which is our goal as Christians, depending on the power of his spirit, not our own effort. Being alive to God seems to go hand in hand with great sorrow, grieving, and tears. There was an older man who was part of our church the first three years when we were a little baby church in a skating rink, and I preached under a disco ball, which was awesome. I miss it. Okay, um, And there was this man, and he had started three churches on his own, and he was this nationally known Christian leader and preacher. And I was like, dude, Don, can you preach every now and then? Because I'm just like this baby little pastor. People are like, where's the real pastor? Oh, they're looking at, is he coming next week, you know, because I was so young and and idiotic. And I was like, Don, if every now and then you stand up and preach, people would be like, hey, this is a real church. And he said, Mike, I can't. The older I get, the more I learn about God's tender heart for the broken, and the more I'm in touch with people's hurt, I can't put the two together teaching the Bible without weeping the whole time. I thought, how beautiful. 
one of the men I know who's most alive to God, weeping in the face of the blues and the Bible. And so Jesus, our third reflection, Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, who lived a perfect human life, feels it full on. He feels the full weight of the moment. He refuses to skip over, go around, transcend, ignore, or deny this part of being a human being in a fallen world. And therefore, he dignifies this part of your experience and mine to bring it before God openly. It's why we're singing the blues in church. You have Mary Martha, friends from Jerusalem who've all come, and they've been sitting shiva and mourning for three days. This is like massive weeping and wailing. They did it big in that culture. Giant, brutal scene of pain and weeping, and Jesus doesn't skip over. zippity doo da, the resurrection's come in. Why the long faces, everybody? He doesn't do that. <laughs> he allows the full force of loss in this life to hit him, and he weeps. Jesus wept. And if this is a part of the perfect human experience of Jesus the man, then it's part of the abundant life for you and I that he offers to us as we follow him even in our blues. Our fourth observation is Jesus is our example that it's more important, or I'll say just as important, to weep as to spend time speculating why. It's not wrong to speculate why, but it's just as important to weep. Weeping and why. Why did this happen? He spends no time in this passage. Go home and read it. Giving long theological, intellectual, philosophical explanations for this, right? Hey, you got to understand that when Adam and Eve first ate the thing, and then the serpent and the snake, and then ever since then death. He doesn't go into all that, although he could have. He doesn't go into why. He weeps. I don't know why my Nana lived with Alzheimer's for the last 25 years of her life on this earth and while we had to try to figure out can you love somebody when they're trapped deep inside there I don't know why that happened I don't know why one of our ministry partners here in her 40s had brain surgery 11 months ago and now 11 months later she's tumor free and yet in the last year two of our ministry partners have died from cancer why her why them I don't know but I know there are things that are simply awful in this life and that God grieves over them as well. This is his heart. And he grieves over them until God decides it's time in whatever math he does to arrive at that conclusion. It's time and he sends Jesus back to transform it all into his ultimate eternal kingdom. And I don't have nice clean answers in the meantime for why them, why not me. And anybody who gives you a nice clean answer for suffering and evil is trying to sell you something more than likely. Be leery of them. The Psalms in our Bible, the whole middle section of your Bible, are full of prayers and songs and blue songs that bring why and weeping equally before God. And they don't resolve the why question. They just finally get to where Jesus is. About the only why that Jesus gives is ultimately it will all give God glory. And you just have to trust that through his resurrection. So Jesus, in the midst of all the sorrow, weeps. Something else really important that Jesus is modeling and teaching us here. In the words of another writer, I like how he phrases this. If we don't let it out, then it's still in there. This is what it means to be most fully human. Alive to God and alive to yourself. You know how if a wound, I don't know how long it's been since you've had a big old nasty wound, you know. That might have been when you were a kid. But you know how if you've got a big wound, if you don't let it flow a little bit, and in fact, the medical term is weep. If you don't let that wound weep out a little bit, seep a little bit, and get cleaned out, then the wound and the stuff inside of it will, will back up and it'll rot, and it rots into pus. You know, the grief, the anger, the sadness in you and I, it'll turn emotionally, spiritually, existentially into something like pus. Hatred toward the world as it is the pus of deadness toward God, the pus of oblivion toward beauty and love, and that you can go on and actually know and trust other people. If you don't lance that wound and let it weep, let it bleed a little bit in grief like Jesus did. Jesus lets it out. He pours it out before moving on to the next thing. Two places in this text describe Jesus as being deeply troubled in his spirit. 
And what's the response when you're deeply troubled in your spirit? He weeps. Yeah, according to your temperament and your makeup and all that. But he weeps. Because if you don't let it out, it's still in there somewhere. And Jesus lets it out. It's possible that you went through a great loss 20 years ago. And you haven't grieved it properly. And you're still carrying it around. And there's some pus going on. Maybe you went through a divorce, a breakup, abuse, some sort of betrayal. And you just whoo, skip right over it. If you don't let it out, it's still in there somewhere, and it's putrid. And it's sucking some life from you in some way toward the goodness of life and what God can have for you. Jesus, fully connected with God, a completely whole person alive to God. Almost every religion, even if they don't honor him as the Son of God and the Savior, they honor Jesus as the most alive person who ever lived, okay? So even if you're not a Christian, you got to give him that. He's human and divine, we believe, and he's so healthy, he just lets it out. Which leads me to conclude, if after a loss, the Son of God needs a good cry, so do I. And there's some weird perceptions out there that work against this because we have them and read in our Bible. In some Christian settings, there's this perception that if we're seen as mourning after a loss, it means we doubt God's goodness. Right? So when you lose something, something horrible happens, if you're in one of those kind of Christian circles, they're like, no, 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 don't weep. Don't weep. Right? We have to tr- we trust God. We're fine. We're fine. Right? And so people aren't allowed to express their God-given, natural, healthy emotions in the immediate after, in the immediate hurt of a loss. And that's really sick and wrong and messes people up for a lifetime. Jesus wept, and he's read the end of the story. Uh, There's something else that happens, not around here, I mean, with anybody I know, but I've heard that especially men, like, believe that it's not strong or confident or assertive to cry or get emotional when they're hurt. Have you ever heard of guys like that? Anybody? Sort of this macho thing, and it needs to be addressed. You know, the guy goes with the girl to the movie, and it gets all sad and weepy at the end. You know, it's just like the weepiest one, and he can't help it, man. It's just a little tear, and he has to say, oh, got a popcorn kernel here, it looks like, right? He can't admit it, and he can't just let it out. And this, that's a weird, twisted, totally not Jesus impulse, that if you're not emotional, you don't weep, that somehow you're strong, and that's the ideal. No, no, Jesus is the ideal. You have in Jesus somebody who has power over life and death, who was the agent of creation from the beginning, who will be the agent of burning and reforming all the elements at the end. He was a manly man. And Jesus wept to be fully alive, fully human in the face of loss. And this is God's intention for you. A manly man who was here at our 8 o'clock service told me uh, afterward that when it comes to men, weeping eyes prevent a swollen head. (laughs) And all the sisters in the house said, amen. (laughs) Uh, As we go through life, we get burned, betrayed, and so some of us cut down on our ability to feel. And over time, what happens is, hey, wait, if this is what it's like to feel and then lose, I don't want to feel that again. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's in a church. You got your hopes up with other people who are Christians or a, a failed marriage, and you felt burned. And so you cut down on your ability to feel. But what happens is if you've done that, you've shortened the bandwidth. (laughs) It's gotten narrower. And as we lose the ability to feel great emotion, like to feel such great pain, we also lose the ability to feel great joy. And to be able to feel one, you got to feel the other. And so what we have in Jesus is the true man, the true human being, who's fully alive with the capacity to feel and express great joy at the high end and great grief. And he lives in you, Christian, by faith. If you put your faith in Jesus, his resurrected spirit lives in you to bring you more and more fully alive like him when you live by faith, even in your grief and loss, and you let it out as your spiritual act of worship. It's a more painful way to live, but it's a more alive way to live. Has your heart grown cold? I'm asking you. Have you not grieved something properly? And this series, this month, is your time to reflect on it, name it, bring it out before God. We have a chalkboard out here in our prayer shack (laughs) that maybe at some point during this series, you just need to go write it on there. Grieve your loss. 
I used to believe that when I went through change, the strong people were the ones who went through change and could say, that wasn't a big deal. I can roll with it. No big deal. But I realized that's not strength. We always experience loss all through life, not just when someone dies, because every change involves some sort of loss. To decide the English meaning of that word means the death of one option. And if we don't acknowledge the loss of change even, it stays with us. Maybe it's the kid who yesterday like was this tall, and now like you blinked, and they're this tall, and they're 20, and they're out of the house, right? And you find yourself grieving, which is healthy, to realize things aren't how they used to be. My son Austin, when he was three, he got this intuitively. Whenever he would have to make a choice, he would sit on his bed and cry because he knew intuitively it meant the death of the other option that he didn't choose. Change is loss. You had this group of roommates and you were all tight and you're like, man, this is life, man. It's better than a TV show the way we all are together. And then this one moved away, this one went there, and that one got married and it's different. It's not like it was. And you're like, I'll probably never get that back. And when we're most fully alive, we're in tune to these things and we properly grieve them. That doesn't mean we're crying all the time, but life has changed. You moved here from another place and you're like, I should be fine with this. Lake Norman rated top place to live, you know, number one Reloville in America. But you left some people behind and, and yeah, you love it here and you move for some good reasons, but leaving a place involves change and loss. I got this new job, it's better than the other job, but I'm not with them. Life is not how it was, it's now this way, and it's okay and necessary to go through a grieving time. Birthdays, need I say more, right? And not just when you're older, when your kid gets another year older, and in the midst of that joy, you think they're not that age anymore, they're this age, and you celebrate them growing up another year, but within it, if you're honest, you're like, that's my little dude, you know, and now he smells, right, right? <laughs> Great joy, great joy is often tinged with sorrow because it involves change. Jesus wept. What happens in our world is we fly from transition to transition without stopping to grieve. But we need to stop and grieve and go, it's not how it was. I need to grieve it in order to follow Jesus and be a fully alive to God person. Well, here's the last thing. Verse 23 to 25, Jesus says something fascinating to Martha. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am, notice present tense right now, not like at the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm like life right now. And anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives, this is present tense right now, by believing in me will never die. And then he says this question that we left hanging earlier. Do you believe this? You, yes or no, do you believe this? Good one to deal with. Jesus says, hey, Lazarus is going to rise again. And then she quotes a Bible verse from Daniel 11. And it's like, yeah, in eternity, things will be all fine. I'm good with that. And Jesus goes, no, no, I'm talking about now. Do you trust me now? Because those who believe now, I give life now. <laughs> now. I am the resurrection and the life now. Do you believe in me? I'm not just talking about someday in the sweet by and by. Do you trust me now? And this is where we end, friends. Do you trust me now? Do you believe what I'm saying? Do you believe my way is best in the face of loss and in the face of everything? Do you trust me with your parent who's stuck in the haze, the fog of Alzheimer's, that you'll find a way to love them? And that somehow it'll come out okay if you just follow Jesus in that experience of loss. Do you trust me now with the person you care about so much and you miss them so much? Do you trust me now in your singleness? Will you follow me in the next five minutes and how you live spiritually, morally, publicly in every part of your life? Do you trust me now, the next five minutes in your life as well? as in eternity. And what I want to offer is that today and these next couple of weeks in our series is God calling you to grieve something so your hurt doesn't get stuck putrefying into some form of hate. What is the loss you need to name? How do you need to grieve it? Who do you need to grieve it with? We're giving you ways to do this. 
in our prayer shack on your way out. You can write it on the blackboard. You can pray with somebody. Me and our prayer team are back there after every service. We've got some groups going on, one in Sunday evenings, one that starts next week on Monday night. Specifically, people in the prayer shack last week talked to me about need for forgiveness. We've got two great groups started, joining a community group. How do you need to name and grieve your loss? Let's pray. Uh, Would you stand as I pray for us? Heavenly Father, we are singing the blues with a Jesus who who can raise the dead. And yet he still weeps. We're worshiping Jesus who insists we're forgiven. We're reconciled to you, God, a holy God, because of his righteousness for us. And he just calls us to trust this. And so we trust Jesus with our salvation, with our forgiveness. And we trust you with our blues. And how a world with cancer, you're still on the throne. And so, God, we celebrate life today and we mourn death And we thank you that we don't grieve like those who have no hope, yet we do grieve. And Jesus, may we be people. Some of us who, for the first time, answer your question, yes, I believe, right now. And all of us who do believe, Jesus, we want to be more like you. And we rely on the power of your spirit now to illuminate the loss that's still in there that we need to grieve. Help us to do so this month with people whom we love, led by your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in peace, friends.